Okay, so I'm very excited to be tonight with you guys and I'm very happy that you joined. Um, and I want to thank you all for organizing these events because uh, they are very important for us astronomers because it makes us feel like what we are doing is actually have an interest and a meaning um, besides only the, the scientific one. So um, tonight, not this evening actually, I'm going to talk to uh, you about uh, massive star formation. We're going to go through what we know, what we don't know, which is definitely more than what we know, and what we can do to learn more. Before doing this, I would like to introduce myself a little bit. So my name is uh, Giuliana Cosentino. I am an origin postdoctoral fellow at Chalmers University. I work in the group of uh, Professor Jonathan Tan in the Department of Space, Earth and Environment in the Astronomy Unit. I'm originally from um, Italy. I come from Palermo, which is in the San Mi Sicily. I did all my undergraduate studies in, studies in there. Then I moved to London to do my PhD at University College of London. Then I visited Munich um, for a year at the European Southern Observatory as a visiting PhD student. Then I went back a couple of months uh, in London to get all the things sorted to finalize the PhD. And after that, I moved here in Sweden. Um, I moved here at the end of 2019. So I would say this is my, I just completed my first year in Sweden. And I have to say, I, I couldn't be happier. Okay, so let's get into the topic. Let's uh, talk about these massive stars. But before, before we get really into it, I would like us to agree on some terms, because before we talk about massive stars and massive star formation, we need to understand what these things are. So for massive star, we um, intend all the stars that are fully formed and that have a mass that is eight times, at least eight times the, the mass of our sun. So for comparison, here is the sun, now our favorite star, and these are stars of various mass um, that are bigger than the one of the sun. Of course, this does, uh, doesn't only mean that these stars weigh more, but it also means that they are bigger in size. These are only an example, but I think that the biggest star, the biggest one of the biggest anyway, that we know so far, has a mass that is 350 times more than one of the sun, so it's quite uh, impressive. We call massive star formation all these uh, all those processes, this group of processes, physical and chemical, that leads from a bundle of gas that it doesn't have much, um, um, that is not coherent, that is not uh, compact, to a star that is fully formed and there is burning elements to form heavier ones, and there is the little shiny object that we all know. Okay, so let's get into, let's start from what we know, let's be positive, um, and let's talk about uh, the life cycle of stars. First of all, we call it a cycle because the beginning and the end are connected to each other. Uh, the first step in this cycle is called, called molecular clouds. Molecular clouds are basically um, the den one of the densest things that you can find in, in our galaxies and in other galaxies. They have the shape, they, they basically are the equivalent or the analog of the clouds that you can see in, in the sky when it's raining. Um, they are made of um, particles that can be in the form of atoms, that can be in the form of molecules, and uh, a tiny percent of it is also made of some particles that are called interstellar dust. We will see this thing later on, uh, but this dust is uh, very little, it's like 1%, but it's actually very important. Uh, it's 1% in our, in our whole galaxy, but it's very important. At some point, this cloud that lives the life um, uh, peacefully, for some reason, they start to fall under their own gravity. This happens locally in certain spots of the cloud, this starts to collapse. We say that the gas collapse. And what it's doing is actually falling down and getting denser and denser and hotter and hotter. 
when the density is too much to actually be able to to exist as a cloud um the molecules and the atoms in this gas um, start to fuse together so a molecular cloud is made uh, mainly of hydrogen uh, and when the gas is too dense and too hot what happens is that this hydrogen two particles of hydrogen fuse together and they become an atom of helium these are called thermonuclear reactions and the and it is exactly when this uh, reaction uh, starts that we say that the star is born. But this uh, little newly born star is not exactly as the one that we know and we look up in the sky. Because this uh, core hot, that is hot and dense, and in which the hydrogen is becoming helium, is actually surrounded still by some of the gas and the dust that was in the cloud. And it forms like this cocoon, like uh, um, an envelope, um, that's, that's still surrounded the stars and then that is still falling on the star. Um, we call this object a protostar because in the center there's a little newly formed star, but there's also this uh, cocoon. Now, in this uh, stage, um, these uh, stars are very powerful and um, very wild, I would say. So what they do, basically, they uh, eject material uh, as these, uh, uh, what we call jets and uh, molecular outflow, but they also emit a strong wind uh, that is made of particle and radiation. And this all causes this cocoon to disperse, to dissolve. When this cocoon is completely dissolved, what remains is the little star that was at the center. And this is the, called a massive star. A star is born at, uh, for all extent. Um, and these are the kind of objects that we are used to. Uh, let's have a look a little bit in detail at this object here. So basically, if I have to compare, I would say that we went, uh, this is the phase in which the star is still a, a baby. And this is when it becomes a kid. Now in this phase of uh, uh, this is the main phase of the of the stars. They're called uh, to be in what we call the main sequence. So the normal kind of stars we're used to. They're not doing nothing special. What is happening in there is basically that uh, um, the star tends the gas and the, the hot plasma that the star is made of tends to make the the star fall down. So this is the action of gravity that compress the star. But then thermonuclear reactions that are inside and that are happening inside are releasing energy. The stars use this energy to contrast the gravity. And so it's like a pressure is happening, is, is occurring. So this, uh, the pressure tends to make expand the star. The only thing is that this pressure and this gravity are exactly the same. So the stars live, live uh, their life peacefully um, in perfect balance between gravity and pressure. But, so we said that uh, in this phase, what is happening is that uh, two, ad two atoms of hydrogen are um, fusing together to form an atom of helium. But at some point, the hydrogen in the star uh, comes to an end. It's not an infinite uh, reservoir. There's so much hydrogen that the star can burn. So at some point, the hydrogen is not enough uh, to, be, to be fused together. So what's left is uh, organized in this uh, tiny shell around the star that form the first layer of the star. At this point, it's like the thermonuclear reaction are, are turned off. There's nothing that, com that uh, contrasts gravity. And so the star goes uh, in a certain... <laughs> I would call it a teenage and rebellion phase, um, in which basically start to contract and then to expand again. It becomes so hotter at first, it becomes colder at, uh, in a second time point. This goes on until the, the, the stars become dense enough that the helium that was produced in the previous phase is now burned together. So the two atoms of helium are fused together to form an atom of carbon. 
and, and the star is, uh, has reached an equilibrium again between gravity and pressure and, and um, starts another phase of its life. Um, of course, at some point also helium run to an end, and so we go through uh, again some adjustment and the carbon start to be fused together to form neon and so on. But every time that an element more um, that is heavier is produced, gravity becomes bigger and bigger. So um, the pressure that I need to contrast this gravity is also more. At some point, this star, uh, the, the, these thermonuclear reactions are not enough con to contrast the gravity. And this happens when uh, iron has been produced and the next step will be to fuse together two atoms of, um, of iron. This uh, cannot happen because the gravity at this point is too much. And uh, basically uh, what, uh, what happens is that the star implode and uh, release um, a sudden wave of energy and also all the material that has been producing is in, in this nucleo, uh, nucleo and produce what is called a supernova remnant. You may have seen a nice picture of this supernova and supernova remnants. So these are, in my opinion, among the most spectacular um, objects in our galaxy and in other galaxies. Um, they release so much energy and so much um, elements that uh, are among the most uh, powerful things that can happen in our galaxy. It is estimated, if I don't remember, if I remember correctly, the every year roughly 30 supernova remnants explode in a galaxy, roughly. So these uh, supernova remnants uh, re-inject into the um, in our galaxy all the material that have, the, they have been producing and all the energy. But the little, the, the central part of the star can survive this and uh, can take two different paths of evolution depending on, on what was the initial mass of the star. If the star was big but not that big, so if it has a mass that was between 10 and 30 times the one of our, so the, the, our sun, what happened is that this central core, all the electrons and protons in this central core of the star are fused together to form neutrons. And what remains is called a neutron star. So a star that is totally made of uh, neutrons. Um, I'm sure you know that uh, an atom is made of uh, electrons, protons, and uh, neutrons. Um, and this is all that remains. These things are extremely heavier, heavy, um, and they spin extremely fast. So the period of a neutron star can be as small as a millisecond. And uh, a fun fact is that uh, most of these stars, uh, from their pole, are emitting radiation, are emitting light. There is, um, it's like a laser. This laser uh, spins with the star, and basically sometimes uh, can be caught from, our, from Earth. Uh, the first time that this uh, Mm, signal was uh, caught and um, is so precise and repeats itself uh, at such precise um, times that the scientists thought that this was uh, a signal um, sent by aliens. So they called this object non neutron star, but they called them LGM, which means little green man, because they thought it was aliens. Then, thanks to the words of uh, Jocelyn Bell, uh, we know that these uh, are now stars of the, all, the, all effect, and a lot of people have studied them. Okay, this happens if the star is less than 30 times the solar masses. What happens if the star is heavier than that, if it has more mass than that? Well, in that case, we are left with a black hole, because this uh, core, there's no way that it can contrast um, the gravity that is uh, suffering, and what we are left is a pierce, what we call a pierce uh, hole in the space time, which is a black hole. Of these black holes, we know roughly nothing. We got uh, 
an image, uh, an image of it basically a couple of years ago. Um, it really wasn't. Uh, they were theorized by lots of people um, among these Albert Einstein, but really there there's not much that we know. What we know is that inside that thing, physics as we know it doesn't work, which scares us uh, a lot. We know that the the, get, the closer we get, um, the slower times become. And uh, we also know that they are so dense that not even light can escape. So there's a lot of uh, people trying to study black hole to prove all the theories that we have. Um, and this is a long work, it's a long way ahead. Okay, so now we know our star um, is born, more or less, how it evolves and how it dies. But the real question is, why should we care about all this? What makes these objects so relevant that they deserve an entire branch on astronomy um, and astrophysics to actually, um, for them? Well, massive stars are among, uh, are probably the source of energy for our galaxy. Um, they produce, they, they release this energy and they do it in a, in a fast way because uh, a massive star burns elements very in a very fast way, um, even 10 times faster than what a, a small star like our sun does. Um, so this energy can be used by the galaxies in which these stars are located to evolve, to change in time. And that's why we observe so many different types of galaxies, because they are at different evolution, evolutionary stages. Another important thing, so, so we can under, if we understand massive stars, we can also understand the galaxy evolution. Another thing is that the energy released by winds, molecular outflows, jets, and supernovae makes the gas of our galaxy like a, the water in a boiling pot. Um, so they stir and mix all this material, and this set the condition um, they may be necessary to form new stars. So if we want to understand our star form, we actually need to start to study massive stars. Um, finally, but no less important, is that uh, thanks to supernova remnants, all the elements that are synthesized within a star, they're actually re-injected uh, back into the galaxy, into the inter what we call the interstellar medium, some of the space between stars. Um, they're re-injected. It makes the galaxy uh, always uh, chemically more and more complex. This affects us directly because uh, all the elements and the atoms we are made of uh, comes from a supernova or a massive star. So the iron in our blood, the calcium in our bones, this, is all, uh, this has all been produced and assembled in these objects. Uh, so if we really want to have a chance to understand ourselves, we really need, need to look at the stars. Okay, so from this picture, it seems like we have got it all. We know how they're born, we know how they evolve, we know how they die, we know why this is, import this is important. But in this picture that we have discussed, there's a bit of dirt under the rug. This is due to the fact that I have cheated a bit and I didn't tell you that of these, the step that goes from a molecular cloud to a protostar, basically we know very little. So I told you how there are some point molecular cloud collapse, but we have no idea why they collapse. What makes the gas in a cloud collapse? Another question that we have and for which we have no answer so far is uh, how much this uh, collapsed gas needs to be uh, for thermonuclear reaction to start or um, for are all these collapsing clouds form star? This is another question. Another question is after the gas is collapsed, what happened? There are several theories. Do we form uh, a big star that uh, goes uh, on his way uh, as a whole, or do we have multiple little stars that fuse together to form a bigger one? This is uh, for something for which we don't have an answer yet. Of course, to cover in 40 minutes, 45 minutes, this is quite a lot. So today I want to 
um, discuss this part over here. So I would like to uh, explore a little bit more with you this, uh, this question. So what makes the gas in a cloud collapse? We don't have an answer for it. So we are going just to um, explore what are the theories that we have and how can we, um, how, how can we test them. However, the other questions will not be totally uh, um, unexplored because I know that uh, Jonathan Tan is giving you a lecture very soon. Uh, he's my boss, basically. Um, and he will cover several, several of, these, uh, of these topics. And I also know that Ruben Fedriani is giving you a lecture and he will focus on this last question over here. He will go in a, in a lot of details about it because this is his topic, is what he's working on. I, on the other hand, work more on this. Okay, so if we really want to understand our cloud collapse, what we need to study is these molecular clouds. We need to understand what they're made of, really, in detail, um, how they behave, how, they, how fast they go, what is their interaction with the surrounding environments. Let's uh, uh, give a little bit more detail and repeat a little bit what a molecular cloud is. So a molecular cloud, sorry, is a dense structure in the interstellar medium. So again, the interstellar medium is the space between stars. Um, these are some nebulae or, or nebulae or clouds. Um, they're, and they're made of molecules from which the name molecular clouds because they are different from atomic, which are mainly made of atoms. These are made of molecules, so more complex, and contains a tiny part of dust, which the, these interstellar dust, these, are these particles that have the size of the smoke of a cigarette. These objects are extremely cold. They, are, they have a temperature that is lower than 25 Kelvin, which means that there, there is a minus 250 Celsius-ish. This is very, very cold. And they also are dense, which means that a centimeter cube of a molecular cloud contains roughly mm, a thousand molecules, but it can go up as high as a million molecules, for example. Now, this is dense, but this is dense for interstellar standards, for space standards. Um, by comparison, the other regions of the interstellar medium can have a density per centimeter cube that is from one to 100 particles, but they don't go very up. Uh, so in general, these are denser with respect to other regions. But if we actually compare this density to the one that we have on Earth, these are, these are basically nothing. So imagine that the, the atmosphere, so the, the air that we breathe um, contains 10 to the 23. So this is one followed by 23 zeros. We only have three in here, uh, molecules per centimeter cube. So these are dense, but because we are in space, if we were on Earth, we wouldn't even realize that this, uh, this is something. Okay, so most of the time, these clouds are called dark clouds. This is because uh, since they are so cold and relatively dense, Mm, this cloud blocks and um, they block and absorb all the um, all the light that comes from stars behind them, for example, or the surrounding. Um, so basically, um, they they block this visible light or infrared life light that we will see later. So we call them dark clouds. Now this darkness um, is exactly what made them what, what made possible their discovery. Um, the very first discovery of molecular clouds was done by Sir William Herschel and uh, his sister Caroline, I think. Um, basically, they were looking at the, at the sky. They were counting stars because uh, Sir William Herschel was uh, very passionate about astronomy. They were counting stars and they realized that some areas of the sky had uh, less stars than others. See, we really mentioned didn't have powerful telescope at the time. So they, he, he called, uh, with his sister, they called these holes in the sky. It's only 
at the late, I would say, um, in the 90s, uh, basically, that the, this hole in the sky um, were uh, realized to be molecular clouds. And even then, with the telescope that they were at the time, only the very small one were, uh, were detected. Only when we started to send telescopes in space, uh, we realized that there, were, there was more to what was seen at the moment. So we sent to, uh, to space uh, telescopes. Uh, the, the first telescope who was um, observing uh, the sky um, was uh, the mid-course experiment. And it was observing uh, roughly two, mil two micro. And then there was uh, um, the infrared um, space observatory um, sent out. Then there was uh, a telescope called after Herschel that is called the Herschel telescope. And there was another one called Spitzer. All these telescopes uh, looked uh, at the sky. So uh, they basically are observing our galaxy, but they are observing it from inside. So we are piercing the... It's like we are slicing uh, the, the middle of our... the plane of our galaxy. And this is exactly... This is the plane of our galaxy that you see here. So you see this is where the center of our galaxy is. And uh, this image is taken from Spitzer. And each color corresponds to a certain type of light that we will see. So all these uh, dark features that we see in, uh, um, in, uh, in the orange uh, ellipses slash circles are molecular clouds. The, the peculiarity of these clouds is that they are extremely uh, massive. The more is the gas in there, uh, the bigger is the stars that you can form, which means that this cloud host have the potential to form all these massive stars that we that we have seen. Okie dokie. Um, okay, this slide is more to show you that we astronomers can also be fun sometime. And most of the time, we are the only one that understand each other. Um, but basically, uh, these clouds can have uh, all the shape that you can imagine. Um, when we need to give names to these clouds, we usually use either their coordinates, so their position in the sky, uh, or we use, uh, um, for example, if the, uh, the cloud is along the line of sight of a certain constellation, we call it like the constellation. Um, and finally, but this is not very used anymore, we, um, we give the name of the person that has discovered the cloud. Nowadays, this is not done anymore because uh, people discover groups of these clouds all the time, so it's really not doable. But if you ask scientists uh, or astronomers, um, very few will know the, the clouds for their real name. Because we usually give names that are only related to their shape. So you may have seen this uh, here, this cloud here, many times. And if I say horse head nebula, of course, you will all understand what I'm talking about. But if I give them the, <laughs> the name that is the official one, not many scientists will understand what is it that we are talking about. And there are all the shapes that you can imagine. We have a molecular cloud called a brick because it resembles a brick. Or there's, um, uh, there's a molecular cloud that is called freccia rossa, which means the red arrow, um, which only because it's very fast, it resembles um, an arrow. Um, so we call it like the trains in Italy. And, and we can go as far as you like. Anyway. Mm. Okay, let's um, let's take a closer look at this mole uh, at this molecular cloud. We have talked about their their discovery, their shape, but what they what are they made of? So as we said, they are mainly made uh, made of uh, molecules, and these molecules can be found as a gas uh, that the, um, the, the cloud is made of. Um, so this cloud over here is called the snake because because it resembles a snake in the mind of the astronomer that saw it first. Um, so this kind of clouds um, is made of this gas, uh, made of molecules. Um, as I said, the 
um, most abundant molecule is molecular hydrogen. So it's a hydrogen made of two atoms. And then we have uh, a CO, so carbon monoxide is the second abundant, most abundant molecules. But there's a tiny percentage of these molecules that is extremely complex. We have uh, molecules that can be made up to 60 or 70 item, atoms um, altogether. Um, these uh, molecules, so we can find them in, in the gas phase, but we also find them as um, in, uh, in these dust grains uh, that we have mentioned many times. So this dust, this interstellar dust is basically a particle that are as small as a micron, so um, 10 to the minus 6 um, meter, so it's like very, very small. They have the size of the smoke of a cigarette. And they, the center is made of uh, like a rock, a tiny rock, and this rock is made of uh, silicon and carbon. But since this cloud is so cold, the molecule from the gas phase produce a layer of ice around this core and this ice is made mainly of water and in this ice of water there are embedded a lot of more complex molecules like methanol, ammonia, uh, some uh, polycyclic uh, aromatic carbons, hydrocarbons and etc. And uh, these complex molecules are extremely interesting for, uh, for astronomers because uh, they may hold the information on how life was created, was um, appeared on Earth, how this uh, complexity, that is the chemistry we are based on, may have started. And what people are trying to understand now is whether we can detect in these molecular clouds uh, the building block molecules. There are, for example, the building blocks of amino acids that are extremely important for the functioning of a, of a human body. This is a whole branch uh, of astronomy that is called astrochemistry. So it's the study of all the reactions, uh, physical and chemical, that brings to the formation of these complex molecules. Now, we know that uh, in these objects, uh, so in molecular clouds, more than 200 molecules have been, have been found so far. They are either very simple or extremely complex. But the interesting thing is uh, that all these molecules tell us something. Each of them brings us a, a piece of information. And when we put together all this information, it's like we assemble a puzzle and we get a full picture of, of these molecular clouds. And this is what we are doing right now. So, for example, a molecule like CO, uh, so the carbon monoxide, will tell us the global structure of the clouds because it's a bit everywhere. Other molecules, like for example HCO, plus, this molecule over here, only is produced only in the denser part of the clouds. So it, it tells us where the where the dense gas is, and so on. Molecules that tells how, how hot is the cloud and stuff like that. But, so, so the key to understand molecular clouds and to study molecular clouds is to actually study the molecules that com compose uh, the cloud. But it's very difficult for us to travel to a molecular cloud, uh, take a sample of this molecule, bring it back in a lab and study them. This is absolutely not doable. First of all, because it would take us uh, many human lives just to reach the cloud. Um, just not, not to mention how expensive that would be. That would be work for no astronomer. So what we actually do is to... So these molecules, uh, they are not still. They move in space, they vibrate, but they also rotate. All these movements, these uh, movements in space, this rotation, this vibration, uh, makes uh, uh, so that these molecules emit light. So the, the job of an astronomer is actually to catch this light, to collect this light with telescope, and to analyze it. And I can assure you that these lights bring us all the information that you need. So really light is all we need to study this object. Um, now, since I didn't know, um, I prepared this slide. I'm sure that most of you know already this, um, but I want just to give uh, to go through it just to be sure that we are all on the same page. But I'm sure 
this is an information that you all already have. So these lights there is emitted from molecules or from objects in space in general, um, even from star, from anything, and travel to us. And we place a uh, telescope in a special uh, precise place and we collect this light. Now the light um, as we see it, as we know it, can be approximated to the shape of a wave. Uh, depending on the kind of light that I'm observing, this wave has a different shape. So to catalog this light, this different kind of light, we assign to each wave, to each different wave, a number. This is called the wavelength. The wavelength is the, the length in meter of the, of the space between two uh, peak of the wave. When the peak are very close to each other, the wavelength is very short, and we say that the energy is, uh, of the radiation is very high. On the contrary, when the wavelength is very large, the energy that the radiation carry is very small. As you can see, there are different kinds of lights. The least energetic are the radio and microwave. These are typical, the one that we use um, to listen to some music at the radio, to watch some TV with antennas, or um, to place a phone call to our friends, to warm up some food in the microwave. These are, this kind of radiation is used in this uh, everyday life. Gamma ray and X-ray. So gamma ray is very dangerous for us. Um, and <laughs> for nerdy people listening like me, um, gamma rays are the one that made uh, the Hulk. While uh, X-ray, for example, are the one that you use when someone breaks a bone and you want to understand how it's going and to check on the bone. Um, these are X-ray because they can pierce, pierce our skin like nothing. Um, to observe all these different kinds of lights, we have different kinds of telescopes. And each light needs its own telescope because the, the, the technique to collect the light will change. And the, so the engineering side of the telescope will change. When we observe molecular um, clouds, the molecules uh, emit uh, um, because they rotate. And this emission is in microwave and radio wavelengths. So we use this kind of telescope uh, to study the molecular clouds. As you may have noticed, um, while some of these telescopes are on Earth, others need to be sent in space. This is not just because we choose, but this is a requirement. And the reason is that uh, our atmosphere thanks for us, uh, luckily for us, protect us from the most energetic radiation, um, so the one that has the shortest wavelength, um, so, because these are very dangerous for us. So it, it, they, they, can, uh, they would uh, prevent life to develop on Earth. So the atmosphere actually protects us. But this means that if I want to detect, for example, gamma rays, and I put my telescope in here, I will not detect any, anything. Uh, same thing for X-rays, a uh, UV, or at least most of the UV. The visible, the visible actually uh, gets to us. Indeed, we can see the sky, and these are all the wavelengths that the, our eyes can, uh, can catch. Infrared are partially blocked, so it doesn't necessarily mean that we are sending uh, things to space. We can also place them uh, on a plane and make the telescope uh, fly around. We do this with a telescope that is called SOFIA. Um, it usually goes around the, the whole Earth. Um, but for the wavelengths we are interested in, so microwave and radio, mostly radio, telescope can be placed on Earth because the radiation can go through the atmosphere. It's like it doesn't see it. Um, Usually these radio telescopes are located in very dry places, in places in which it doesn't rain much. But you actually don't need to go that far to have a look at the radio telescope. Because there are some, many, located in Onsala. Uh, the Onsala Space Observatory is uh, basically a collection of these telescopes. Um, and it's, uh, if I am not wrong, it's like 
40 kilometers away from Gothenburg. So it's really close. And uh, they organize some uh, visit in, right now in small groups because of the pandemic. Um, but if you're interested, I invite you to contact them and it will be super nice. Um, and they will uh, definitely help you. Another telescope that I use a lot in my research and which I've personally traveled many times is called the IRAM 30 meter. It's located in Spain, in Sierra Nevada. And uh, it's a wonderful place. Uh, it's near to a ski station. And uh, there are a lot of uh, um, different kinds of animals around. The, around is very nice. I took this video when I went there last time. And this is uh, me with a selfie with a telescope. Um, okay. The biggest telescope, radio telescope that we have so far, is called FAST and is located in China. And the diameter of this uh, pan is uh, 500 meters. The reason why we need to go so with so, such a big telescope is because the um, um, law of physics tells us that the, be the, the better I want to see, the better I want to uh, have a look at my object, this, the biggest the telescope needs to be. So it's like every time changing a pair of glasses that makes me better and see better. The point is that there's no much more that you can do than 500 meters of diameter. For example, this telescope is not like the one that we saw in Onsala and at Hiram. This cannot move. You point a different object because the Earth moves, and so the, the telescope moves with the Earth. But itself, the telescope is locked. And this can create some problems because it makes it not very efficient. Also, if I really want to see better than this, because sometimes this is not enough for what I want to do, um, I really need to do a bigger telescope. So what, what scientists have come up with, the solution that they have found, is that instead of doing one telescope very big, we do a smaller telescope and we put them next to each other and we make them work uh, like as a whole, like, uh, like they were a single telescope moving all around together. The best that we have so far is called ALMA, and it's located in the, desert, the Atacama Desert in Chile, and uh, uh, on an eye of 5,000 meters. So actually, you are not, unless the doctor says that you are ready to go, you cannot go. And uh, you cannot stay more than 10 days because this can be dangerous for your health. Uh, to give you an idea, um, this is uh, the kind of signal that this telescope gives us back. So when we say that we observe the molecules, we are not really seeing the molecule itself, but we are seeing the count of them. So this uh, axis will be the frequency, and this would be the count of molecules. Since I uh, experiment in lab and uh, database um, tells us uh, before um, at what frequency I should expect uh, the count of a certain molecules. So when I receive this signal from the telescope, I uh, focus at a certain frequency and I say, okay, this is the frequency at which I should find water. So this peak is, it tells me where the water is, what the water is doing. And from this peak, the seems, uh, insignificant, we can extract a lot of information. We can extract how much of these molecules in there, where it's located, how fast it's going, really a lot of things. Okay, so now we know that we need to focus on molecular clouds, that we need to look at molecules to, start, uh, to study them. We know how to do it. Let's go back to the original question. So the original question was, what makes the gas in a cloud collapse? What makes it fall under its own gravity? As I said, there are many theories. All of them at the moment are all possible because we are testing them. One of those is called gravitational collapse. So basically what is happening is that there's the cloud, like the one in this uh, simulation that is done uh, with a computer. The clouds, uh, it's, um, as I said, the material in the galaxy can be approximated to this uh, boiling po um, pot of boiling water. Since these clouds are so turbulent and continually mix and steer, 
in some localized region, uh, because this density fluctuates, the density can become uh, large enough that uh, these collapse start and eventually a star can be, can be formed. Another theory is called cloud-cloud collision. So imagine that there are two clouds. These clouds move um, across the galaxy because they orbit around the center. And at some points, they found themselves um, one in front of the other, moving, going one toward the other. Of course, they cannot stop. So what they do is that they crash. This is the equivalent of an interstellar car crash. Um, in this crash, in between them, oh, sorry, in between them, here in this region over here, they compress the gas and make it denser and denser so that in this very dense region seen as red uh, um, regions, in red in here, they can produce and form new stars because the density goes up a lot. A third theory um, that doesn't really have a name like the previous one, um, that, that I like to call shockwaves from supernovae, tells us basically that imagine that there's a cloud and this cloud is uh, uh, nearby a star, a massive star that is uh, going on with its life. At some point, this star dies uh, and dies much faster than the cloud. So what it does basically, it explodes as a supernova remnants, as in this case. So it explodes as a supernova remnants. This energy from the supernova travels, so it goes from the center up to until the, the edge, and it hit the cloud, which in this case is this little guy over here. It compresses the gas of the clouds. This energy is absorbed by the cloud, the gas is compressed, and this um, compression uh, rise up the density, so, so the gas can form new stars. These are the three theories. The one that I am trying to study in my research are the cloud-cloud collision and this shockwave from supernova. The, the truth is that I started my PhD started, uh, studying cloud-cloud collision. As many times happen in science, while I was looking for cloud-cloud collision, I found one of those. So I decided to split my time within, between this and this. Um, so in this, in both cloud cloud collision and in this uh, interaction between supernovae and molecular clouds, the things that the two have in common is that this collision and this energy released by the supernova travels as what we call interstellar shocks. So basically, this um, um, this energy released can hit the clouds and can modify them. The, the situation is similar to this. Imagine that there's a guy that is running toward a wall. Of course, the wall, that in our case, in our analogy, is the cloud, um, is much denser than the guy, that in our case is the, the, the wave released, the wave of energy released. So what happens is that the wave uh, gets to the wall, breaks, as the guy fall down, fell down, uh, and the wall, so the cloud, absorb this energy. So the wall, and in this case the cloud, can use this energy to process this energy. So part of the cloud is uh, destroyed, uh, part is compressed. The best way to test this theory for us is to um, detect some trace of this, uh, this um, uh, interaction between uh, the cloud and the, and the energy. So in this case, the trace of the impact. To do this, we use a special molecule. This molecule is called silicon monoxide. Uh, how does this silicon monoxide form and why is it important? Imagine that the energy released by a supernova impact on the clouds. When the, the, the impact occurs, the dust of which the cloud is made, it's destroyed. As we said, the center of this dust contains silicon and carbon. So since the cloud is, the dust is destroyed, this silicon is re-injected into the gas, so mixes with the gas. There reacts with the oxygen that was already there and produce 
with this chemical reaction, they produce this molecule that is called the silicon monoxide. When you look at a cloud, and this cloud is not hit by a wave of energy, there's not really silicon in the gas phase. Um, so even if you were looking at, at this um, silicon monoxide and the cloud was not uh, hit by this uh, wave of energy, you will not see the, any detection. So the peak that you would expect at the frequency won't, wouldn't be there. While when a shock occurs, an interstellar shock occurs, we do see SIO. So the presence of SIO itself tells us that this collision between clouds or this collision between the energy of a supernova and the cloud has occurred. So we like to say that no shock, no SIO. And this is super important for us. We can use this SIO to study a lot of things. Uh, we can study how fast the energy wave was going, how dense the gas was before and after the, 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 the shock. We can study how much of the cloud has been destroyed. We can study whether there are the conditions to form a star. We really can understand a lot. So much, we can understand so much that uh, with my colleagues, we started a new project that is called SHREC. SHREC is an acronym that stands for Shock Interaction Between Supernova Remnants and Molecular Clouds. Um, to be honest, I came up with the acronym, and uh, the truth is that I, choose, I chose first the acronym and then the name. So the thing could be, um, I, could, I could call it SHREC. Um, my colleagues have to, agree, uh, to say they agreed. Um, with this project, uh, we will look at uh, several supernova remnants that are nearby molecular clouds, and we will look for the peak corresponding to silicon monoxide, so SIO, uh, but also these two molecules, HCO plus and HN13C, because these two molecules tell us where the densest gas is located. We will look for a sample of uh, roughly 27 supernova remnants, we have already started the project. We are less than halfway through. And with this project, we are going to, um, to observe, uh, to use the, um, a telescope that is located in Kitt Peak, uh, which is near Tucson in Arizona, in US. And uh, on this mountain, there is Kitt Peak. There are all these telescopes. The one we are used, if I remember correctly, is this one. And um, is this antenna over here, which has a diameter of 12 meter? It's one of the smallest. Um, and we have already started, so we have observed some supernova. One is W41, which is one uh, a very well known one. Um, this color here is the supernova, is the emission from the dust. Um, and these white contours over here are instead some. Uh, um, the, the spots in which we found the silicon monoxide. So we are in the process of st or studying this emission. Another supernova that we, we observed is called IC443. And this is one of the best known uh, supernova by astronomer. And uh, mm, this green over here trace the, the wave of energy released um, by the supernova. And uh, we will look in the, we have seen in this spot over here, so the peak of the SIO and the peak of the HCO plus, and we are in the process of study. In the last five minutes, even less, I would like to tell you what we can do more, uh, because of course we are testing the theory, but still we don't have an answer. So what can we improve to um, to really get 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 to the to the point of these questions? Um, one possibility is to improve our computer, to make our simulation more powerful, and to predict more of what can happen. But, but as much as you can predict, you also need to, uh, to prove that what you have predicted is actually correct. And to do that, we uh, need observations. So the other thing that we can do to, to answer these questions is to have a pair of glass that allow us to see always better and better. Um, and this is done by producing telescopes that are always more and more powerful. 
One of these is the is called the square kilometer array or SKA, and uh, it is uh, so. What scientists are trying to do is to take two of Alma, two arrays like the one of Alma with this collection of telescopes, and to place one in uh, uh, Australia and one in the south of Africa, and to make this work as a um, as the biggest telescope ever ever built. Um, so big that actually we will need to introduce correction to, to take into account the fact that there's a curve between the two telescopes. There is the curve at Robert. Another thing that we are doing is called uh, the James Webb uh, Space Telescope, JWST. This is a very powerful telescope that will look uh, in um, wavelengths that are between the UV and the infrared. And... Uh, it will be launched in October 2021, so this year. People have already started to um, ask to use it uh, with what we call the proposal process. Um, so this is what we are going to do. And uh, this is also my last slide. So I would like to thank you very much, guys, for your attention. And I hope you enjoy the talk.